great to see everybody here uh, after two years of lockdown and COVID. Um, and it's nice to be able to get to see old friends and colleagues again. It also burns the grass in my yard. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk again, and, and thank you, Russ. I uh, couldn't hope for a better last talk to, to follow on, and uh, I hope I'm not repeating anything else that you might have heard uh, on insurance of, of timber buildings. Um, insurance is a, is a key area in the UK, and many of you are obviously not, not from the UK, but you may not have similar problems to us, us, but at the moment there is a critical lack of capacity of insurance in the UK market uh, for, the, um, uh, uh, for the construction of, of large timber buildings. Many view it as a knee-jerk reaction, but I can assure you it's not. It's been very carefully considered, and uh, it's difficult with the constraints of our own building regulations um, to draw any other conclusion that insurance is a challenge. Um, we've put all these thoughts down in this document here, which is available from the uh, Risk Authority website. Um, it seems to have travelled very well indeed and seems to have gone down very well with, with all parties. I think uniquely it is actually produced by the UK insurance industry, and these are the uh, major UK insurance contributors to this report, which comprises a very significant propor proportion uh, of commercial insurance in the UK. So it's been produced with some substance. Many people talk about insurance of massive timber buildings are not insurers uh, and, and never have been. So this should be the authoritative text uh, on, uh, on the subject. Now, I want to touch on a few parts today. Um, the contents for this is, first of all, I'd like to, the crude introduction to insurance. Um, it may sound odd, but really to understand what the challenges are, you do need to understand a little bit about the mechanism of how insurance is provided for large buildings. Um, it's not instantly obvious, it is simple to describe, but hopefully having described it, you'll appreciate what the challenges uh, really are. I don't intend to go into really too much on the background as to why we need timber buildings. Obviously there's a sustainability agenda uh, that we all need to be pursuing and this is very much uh, a part of it. Uh, nor do I intend to sort of describe too much on, on what massive timber is, I'm sure you're all very aware of that. Um, but I would like to put into the concept, uh, the, uh, into the uh, framework of, of the consequences of these changes of not only the materials used in construction, but also the methods of how they're put together, um, and why, particularly in the UK, um, we have no protection in legislation. In fact, I'd go as far as saying that legislation or, or um, compliance of our buildings is absolutely meaningless to insurance nowadays, nowadays with the more uh, modern and uh, types of materials that we're building out of, uh, particularly where, where combustible uh, in terms of the structure, the insulation and cladding of the building. Uh, but to end on a, a better note, I would like to um, <coughs> talk about some design solutions. Uh, on the back of this report, uh, the designers are responding and coming up with some things which are quite innovative. So I think the key takeaways, which I'd just like to put up front, is that <coughs> in the future, designers will need to build in features that enable the insurer to assign an estimated maximum loss value that is something other than 100%. I'll describe what that means uh, in the future, what estimated uh, maximum loss is, but it's a key insurance figure. Um, it doesn't happen natively with compliance, so something more is going to be required. I'm afraid gone are the days of just being able to make the assumption that you can build any building you like and there will be insurance for it. It's simply not there to be had as we build out of, uh, in, in the new ways. The other thing I'd like to uh, provide as a takeaway is what we're talking about is not just about fire, it's about the other perils as well, um, and it's not just about wood um, and everything else. Uh, many things go to contribute to forming the risk profile uh, of the building itself. Now, the insurance perils that we normally consider um, are fire, escape of water, and flood. 
Now, most of them, I'm sure, your talks have been about fire. I'm not too sure you've had anything on escape of water or flood today, but it's a massive concern for insurers. In fact, many insurers, when we were putting this report together, cited escape of water as being a, more, a greater challenge uh, than, than, than fire. Why would that be the case? Because they've simply put, escape of water events are immensely commonplace, and whilst they may not um, have the same total per instant loss as a fire in a major building, there are lots of them, an enormous number, and it amounts to many billions of pounds a year. In the domestic and residential environment, um, the escape of water loss actually accounts for a greater amount of loss than fire and security combined. When you start building out of composite wood materials, maybe it's going to come more to the full fore still. So it was a very interesting thing to find that actually some people are more worried about uh, escape of water. And the loss types that we have that are covered from insurance, with the material damage, the business interruption and continuity of supply of the activities that need to happen in that building, loss of stock, loss of rent, and obviously the displacement costs of the people uh, in that building who will need rehousing in similar types uh, of accommodation. So I'll just take a moment to describe what estimated maximum loss. When you have a large building you want insurance for, it would clearly be very expensive to insure it on the basis that every fire is going to lead to its total destruction. Now, situations like that do exist in the commercial environment, um, but, the, but they're, they're, they're rare uh, and it's very expensive and the form of insurance that you get is very different. It requires levels of control, monitoring, a lot of uh, conditions on the insurance policy and it comes at a price which is probably unfamiliar to people just looking to get a normal building insured. Um, uniquely, I used to live in an environment which, which was like that, a thatched house. And of course, if you have a fire in a thatched house uh, with a straw roof, it only goes one way, 100% loss. So consequently, uh, I would pay every month what most people pay uh, uh, in a year for insurance. Uh, it was a lifestyle choice, though. My wife's, not mine. It would be ridiculous, <laughs> me, me wanting that. But, um, but there we go. Um, so... But how, so how do we ensure a tall building like this? Well, we can assume, if it's got good compartmentation, we can certainly assume that we'd, we'd lose a floor to the fire. Um, we might also assume that there will be damage to smoke caused for the next two storeys up, um, and we can assume that there might be a level of water damage from the firefighting activities to the floor below. So an estimated maximum loss for that building, EML, might be four floors of 17, and it might be insured on that basis. It's quite a crude model, but it's not too far off uh, how it's done. But have a think about what actually goes into making this model work. It requires absolute perfection of compartmentation internally. It, there must be no external fire spread. And of course, it's not difficult to see how really this is the domain of concrete and steel structures, isn't it, in very traditional builds. What happens if things come along that sort of might adjust this and adjust our view of it? And certainly with modern building methods, techniques, extensive use of timber, we might not be talking just about the uh, occupied stage of the building, it might be the, the construction stage also, but we see modular construction which we might introduce new voids for internal fire spread, green walls which might promote fire spread on the outside. Um, <coughs> you can see that this model now no longer works. And this is really at the core uh, of the insurer concerns. I also mentioned that it's not just about what, what buildings are made of. Um, when we actually look at, when I was undertaking this study, and to enable to, ourselves to elicit information from insurers, we wanted to find out what the thresholds of their concern were. And we came out with sort of 26 features. Sorry, you won't be able to read them from here. But briefly put, uh, split down into six categories. Ocu knowing the occupancy and use of the building is important. The scale, that's vitally important. I mean, a small building is always insurable because the extent of damage that can occur is, a, is very quantifiable. But when we start talking about multi-storey buildings, things can get expensive very quickly. So scale is a big part of this as to where the threshold of concern lies. Structure and fabric of the building, obviously the materials used in different parts of the building, which may protect it from different perils. Um, uh, and the materials construction and the structure, installation and cladding of the building. Other risk factors. Uh, it seems, it seems um, dreadful to really to be um, talking uh, about a lot of the other innovatives like green energy, green surfaces, 
um, uh, you know, as, as sort of deleterious factors, but, but, but they are. They, they raise their own challenges, as described in the previous talk. Atria, um, basement car parks, balconies, swimming pools, these all present their own challenges and need, need, need thinking about. Um, but then we have, to counterbalance that, we have the mitigations to fire, uh, the provision of, um, uh, you know, whether you, you protect the voids, um, and deploy suppression systems and the quality of the passive fire protection. And then there are measures that can be made to curtail the likelihood of escape of water and flood events also in the design of that building. So a lot goes into think of that, and actually we've now developed this into a, a further tool for insurers. So when we talk about insurance, well, the relevant types and periods of insurance are obviously we have a construction phase, and we probably don't need to reiterate the challenges uh, that they present, particularly like timber <coughs> framing. We had a lot of uh, pretty poor experience of those and, and still do to this day. Latent defects, I'll talk about that in a moment. Material damage and business interruption is quite obvious. Why have I put latent defects in there? That's not a thing of to do with the, anything you could lose a building over. But actually there was an event in America recently where um, it, it'll be a, a concrete uh, structure uh, which had been neglected so badly on a seafront that it did collapse. Um, due to corrosion of the, I believe, the steel ribbing inside it. Um, but there's a possibility with, with uh, massive timber where long, for long periods of time, slow water ingress, we believe over the latent defects period, which is anything up to 12 or 15 years, the structure of the building could be impacted by small water ingress due to, due to pro small problems. And if that can start to affect the structure of the building, then that gives rise to the potential... Uh, for structural collapse. That's not something that's ever been considered before under latent defects insurance, and maybe it starts uh, to be, need, needs to be uh, uh, considered now. So I think you can see the, the uh, rising concerns, not only of the materials and the structure, but also the types of insurance which are provided also. Understanding what can modify cost is important also on this. Susceptibility of the materials to the specific challenges uh, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's no coincidence, I suppose, that the materials which are resilient against fire and water, concrete and steel um, together, and the ones which are more susceptible, uh, like, like wood, um, you know, they, they, they both have all, that, all have their parts to play. Maintainability, repairability is a big key issue also. I put in accessibility there. I mean, who's to know when... Well, we probably have a pretty good handle on when we need to replace a concrete beam or a steel beam because there's lots of experience and there's probably lots of measures and telltale signs that will allow, allow you to um, uh, make an assessment as to whether it needs replacement. But what about when we come up with a composite timber beam that's been soaked in water or slightly heated in the action of a fire? How will that perform going forward? Is anyone really happy to sign on the dotted line that is, that is safe and doesn't need replacing? And the one thing we do know is that when we're unsure, it gets replaced and it can be expensive if it's part of the structure of the building. So all of these things go to uh, look at the insurability of the building. Now, what insurers have done to this is they've produced a suite of essential principles, and these are basic um, uh, a rule set, if you like, for protecting buildings against fire, flood, escape of water, and the develop development of resilience. And I suppose in saying resilience, I'm talking about things over and above compliance. So that's the sort of insurer lesson over. Um, but everyone's moving to a more sustainable uh, existence, quite rightly. Um, and everyone's making, there's a lot of posturing. Companies announcing that they're going to be net zero uh, in so many years. And the buildings they build as part of that are going to play a large role. But no one's putting any caveats with it as well. And the one thing we know about single-minded pursuits of this type, uh, if they're addressed in an unbalanced way, uh, things can go wrong. So hopefully this can be achieved without reducing safety. But what about without reducing the, the property resilience, the business resilience, the ability of, for the continued provision of services also, without reducing fire and rescue service support? That's a key thing. I mean, the provision of sound fire and rescue service support um, really depends on the stability of the building. And if that's not to be had, then you can expect a lower level of response from the fire and rescue service also unless you take some measures uh, to ensure that that gets ameliorated. Um, and maintaining insurability. Um, no one seems to have thought about insurability of buildings until quite late on. 
So really what insurers are having to deal with is coming from a place where buildings are like this, concrete and steel, and moving to a place where they're more like this, um, wood, modular, green, uh, with many dependent systems also. Now the, we've had some experience with light timber frame construction, and, um, but really we're talking about more the, the, the heavy timber structures, the glue laminate, the post and beam type systems, glue laminated uh, wood, uh, laminated uh, veneer lumber, and um, cross laminated timber, a panelized system, uh, which will be, uh, which are becoming more and more prevalent. And uh, obviously very beautiful, much more sustainable to use, and very convenient to use with many advantages. So we can see that it's a time of great change, but it is important to look at what has not changed in this time. What's not changed is our building regulations in the UK. Now, there's mention of the International Building Code earlier. It really has responded, and I'm sure that it's, uh, and, and it's been done well. Uh, but in the UK, nothing. So if you ask for nothing else, you're going to get the same levels of compliance sort uh, and without any appreciation that we're now building very different types of building and the end game of any fire may be very different. All of the other factors that contribute to the building's insurability, they haven't changed, um, but they may have a relationship um, with the different structural materials which are now being used uh, 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 for it. Also, how people expect buildings to perform in fire, that hasn't changed. And we've had a lot of fires recently where the building has ended up on the ground and you have the occupants and the owners of the apartment standing outside basically saying, what went wrong, clearly there's something wrong. Um, but actually, it might have been a perfectly compliant building. They're basing their expectation on how buildings were historically built, out of bricks and mortar, where high-performing materials were actually used to ensure the life safety component uh, of the building. But that's uh, with the advent of fire engineering in the UK in, in, in sort of uh, the year 2000. There is now an alternative means of doing things. And actually, the only... Um, requirement is to provide equivalency of life safety. The property component, property protection component, uh, there is no equivalency sought for that. But there is also a huge expectation on the availability and cost of insurance and lending, and that's where we have some enormous challenges currently. Tor Building Fire Safety Network delivers high quality safety management training for anyone involved in the fire risk management of high rise or tall buildings. Recognised by the Institution of Fire Engineers, we've been delivering fire safety training since 2011 and many organisations rely on our training for gaining competence in this field. Sign up for our training courses and conferences in 2023. So obviously the International Building Codes were mentioned uh, in the last talk very nicely. <coughs> In the UK, our building codes are strictly for evacuation before collapse of the building. So in the narrow race between the human and the building, the human should always win. And to be fair, it does that very well. Um, but it, uh, it's at the expense of the building, or it can be, if no other measures are taken. In the US, with the International Building Code, well, sorry, in, in, in other codes, you can see that there are um, more resilient, uh, requests for more resilient performance than we have in the UK, and the IBC uh, deals with that uh, in, in greater detail still. So really, compliance in the UK has never been uh, more meaningless to insurability, and what we're finding now is we're in a very uncomfortable position where really uh, de facto regulator are becoming the lenders and insurers, and that's not a good position uh, for anyone. And we really do need our building regulations to respond, but it's not uncommon at the moment for proposals to go in place for tall buildings in timber in the centre of London and after conversations about insurance for them to be uh, built in steel and concrete instead. Hopefully that is a, a temporary measure until <coughs> some reconciliation happens. So our experience with more lightweight uh, combustible forms of construction uh, hasn't been particularly good. These are examples of uh, I think a care home, a couple of hotels and an apartment block and they, you know, no one died in any of these fires, but they did end up on the ground, and we're not used to buildings, large buildings ending up on the ground. So is this the new normal? No, we need to start having a bit of a think about that. Um, so in terms of materials and design, obviously in our essential principles, the 
uh, it, it would be the case, but in sort of insurance terms, uh, the, the first principle is don't build out of things that will burn. It's very helpful. Um, but if wood is to form the structure, um, the, the, there may be an uh, a, there may be an increase for you know increase fire spread, but also uh, um, collapse uh, to to wet perils also. And um, another key factor which I'll dwell more on is it's not just about the materials, but how they're assembled. It's very complicated. Again, highlighted in the last talk as to what goes to actually make up a wall these days. Now, insurers mostly focus on the big stuff of, of what can lead to large-scale fire spread, of which, we obviously, we have three principal mechanisms. This was the fire in, in France, um, up the external uh, side of a building, which had a barbecue on it. I think it took about four minutes to happen. This predates Grenfell by quite a long way. Um, it went up very quickly, but hopefully, in this day and age, that's never going to be a problem again. Obviously, we have an inter the mechanism for internal <coughs> fire spread. This is the stuff of uh, in, through the occupied spaces. Really, this is the, uh, the the language of fire doors and dampers and the like. Um, but really, these new building methods are also introducing a third route in the shape of voids. Since certainly, walls are now quite comp complicated. This is a section taken from uh, uh, the modular building code, and all the yellow areas there are actually voids. So just like a fisherman's net is, you could say, a lot of holes sewn together, you know, what is a wall these days? It's a collection of voids, um, you know, with lots of thin material. And certainly in modular construction there, as you can see, um, not only do you not have a floor slab, which used to be, you know, historically has been the one place, you know, to put fire stopping to pre prevent vertical fire spread, we don't even have a floor slab anymore to protect against. It, it really is quite lightweight uh, construction, which is mostly holes. And anywhere you have holes is a place for fire to get into and to spread. And of course, in a modular building, that also can extend out to the um, uh, to the uh, rain screen cladding system also. Um, so you can see it can be an absolute three-dimensional lattice of voids and never before have buildings relied so heavily on absolute perfection of installation uh, of uh, cavity barriers and, and fire stopping in that. <coughs> the picture on your right is actually a building that was uh, um, in Manchester and that was a light timber frame structure. Um, very simple thing happened here. It was a, um, <coughs> a, a boiler engineer um, was putting on a, a condensation pipe from a boiler uh, through the wall. Uh, the building was dressed up in brick slip so in his mind it was a brick building uh, as he soldered on the small copper pipe, he set the void on fire um, as a light timber frame structure, and you can see the fire just spread in the voids between the occupied spaces. Um, that, build, that fire actually kept igniting every day for the next five days as they tried to chase it around the voids, and they eventually um, <coughs> knocked, it, knocked it down as the only means of ensuring that the fire was actually out. And I think that demonstrates quite nicely the problem with voids. But these are all quite small buildings in comparison to what we're talking about. So I guess that's the sort of large scale challenge that we have. On a microscopic scale, um, let's, let's take a detailing, a detail which is common to every apartment block and every hotel that might be built up in, in, in massive timber going forward. And let's look at the bathroom section. Um, I've got a particular interest in this. We, we've, we've had a bit of a look. So bathrooms generally stacked one on top of the other. Um, so what happens to one can happen to all. Um, generally, it's the location of key service rises and the communi communication route for fire up and a communication route for water down. There's lots of big plastic penetrations and fire stopping will, 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 be, um, uh, will be critical, certainly as the, the, the large sort of soil pipes go through the wall. So we, we need a lot of fire stopping in there. False ceilings, housing, air conditioning units and services, you have loft, loft hatches in these places. Most critically, lots of combustible plastic bathroom furniture. When you actually see how much plastic is now in a bathroom, no longer porcelain, um, it's a big fuel load. And yet most testing is going on just burning wood because it's a wood building. And actually how plastic can modify the, extent, the scale um, of the fire is, is quite something to behold. So, We've got a situation, it's also generally, historically, assumed to be quite an inert area. So when you actually sort of look at it, it's actually quite a, it starts to raise a few red flags just in the, um, when you start to build, uh, introduce this as a, 
uh, an all communicating hazard area in a building, I can see that we will need to have different types of rules uh, and requirements for fire stopping in this environment. It's always difficult on how you fire stop plastic pipe through a combustible, uh, through a combustible uh, wall, um, but some of these are quite, quite large and it's, um, it certainly needs a job doing on it. But I think more seriously, when you consider just a simple scenario like that, <coughs> what if fire does get into a combustible void in a tall building that might be 40 storeys high? Smouldering combustion, you know, relishes the low, that as a low oxygen environment. The fire may eat away for hours or even days before emerging. And the hardest question for any designer to answer is actually what puts the fire out? Is it the suppression system? Well, generally we don't have them in voids. Is it the fire service? Well, we've seen how the fire service can struggle with equipment methods and do they even want to be in a building that's potentially having its structure eaten out from under their feet? Now, we've got to remember here, our building regulations, I'm talking for the UK, are completely time-based. It's about holding fire back for a duration of time. It's not about stopping fire. So, again, I go back, if we're in a situation where actually the whole concept of safety of that building is just stopping uh, fire for a short period of time, but actually it still, at the end of the day, allows it to get into a combustible void where it can then travel, and there's no one or no system that can do anything about that. It's a very difficult position to be in. It's sort of like saying nuclear power is okay as long as we don't have a really big accident. How can anyone ensure at the end of the day that a fire won't get into a combustible void? Right, so I've moaned for long enough on, on these sorts of things. Um, but, uh, and if you left design, if, 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 if insurers were put in charge of design, we'd end up with buildings like this. <laughs> now, this is, this is not the sort of building anyone wants to live in, but it's got some, it's got some good features to it. Um, Non-combustible uh, materials used throughout, excellent compartmentation and very little reliance on, on, on anyone to do anything right. It, it's probably not going to burn down no matter what you do to it. Um, but that's not what the world needs. And uh, uh, so... Um, but building, we, what we need in the UK for building regulations to respond, and as highlighted last time, uh, sorry, in the last talk very well, um, international building codes have specifically addressed it. So all my berating of combustible voids, which I do see as an enormous challenge going forward. In fact, I actually believe in some of the combustible mod modular buildings going up at the moment. I think in the UK we might even be creating the next cladding type crisis here. Um, uh, and... It, it, it's a serious issue. But in the International Building Code, there's no such thing as a combustible void, because if you have one, you either line it, you either protect it with a suppression system, or you fill it with mineral insulation, so it's no longer a void. Simple things, massive impact. And I'll tell you what, if they just made those sorts of changes to our own building regulations, then we probably wouldn't be having so many conversations about insurability of buildings. But looking forward, we do need to uh, find a way forward, and there's potential really for, for hybrid designs of building. Using wood offsets an enormous amount of carbon. There are low carbon versions uh, of concrete as well. Why not hybridize uh, so that we can extol the virtue, the best, extract the best features from all the materials in any given building? And we can do simple things. Building on a concrete core, oh, sorry, on a concrete plinth, the first floor in concrete, we know reduces greatly the risk of uh, arson during construction. Um, we know that it also protects the building very nicely uh, against flood, particularly relevant in London. We know that building it with concrete cores gives you extra stability and may encourage better fire service response. It also um, will give you uh, a nice non-combustible route to provide all services to all floors in, all very beneficial. We could even take the ar argument further and say, well, why don't we put all the um, bathrooms and kitchens in the concrete core as well, um, so that any escape of water events goes through uh, sort of water-hardened water materials. Um, so, and I, I'm glad to say that industry and designers really are responding to this and starting to come out with some very nice balanced designs, which may have skinny use of concrete, uh, replacing an awful lot with a lot of wood, but starting to come out with designs which are feasible, tangible, and hopefully insurable. There's a way to go yet, because there is still a need to um, 
increase uh, capa insurance capacity in the market, but I'm sure some of these designs are certainly an enabler for that. Um, so just to, by way of summary, uh, it's obviously a time of great change. We know that the future is wood, but it's most likely to be a combination of materials um, extolling the, the, the virtues of each of them accordingly in the building. Um, I think we do have a problem with desire to build is running ahead of research, um, but, uh, and, and UK regulations aren't, um, aren't helping us at this moment in time. We're probably still a long way away from the next flyscraper of sort of 60 storeys exclusively in wood, but actually that's not what the UK currently needs at the moment. Um, it probably, 80% of what's being asked for uh, could be catered for probably in buildings which could be built now um, if intelligently put together. And certainly some of the designers are designing out voids altogether, which is a very, very positive mood. Um, so I encourage you to have a look at the, um, uh, the, the, the paper that we have um, here. Uh, it's, it's, it's worthwhile just reading, taking 30 minutes to read, and uh, hopefully is the most succinct uh, place where you'll find uh, anything on insurability in this currently slightly problematic area. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jim.